Welcome everyone. Um, my name is Farida Lagami. I'm the general manager of the Tharawat Family Business Forum. And on behalf of New York University Abu Dhabi and Tharawat, I welcome you to this webinar uh, in um, conjunction with the Family Business Histories Research Project. Um, today's session will take around one hour, and um, it's basically a great pleasure for us to have this session with all of you today, because we are able to launch our third case study that is um, prepared in a series of case studies in um, this research in the in the framework of this research project. Uh, before we get started with our session, um, just a couple of um, uh, hints on how to best enjoy this webinar. Uh, you are most welcome at any given time to ask your questions. Please feel free to drop them in the Q&A field. You can also send us panelists uh, a question in the chat. If you have any issues, please feel free to contact our colleagues, um, either on WhatsApp or on email. And of course, you are free to adjust your view um, as by now, I'm sure everybody is very well versed with the, uh, these webinar settings on Zoom. So um, without any further ado, uh, first of all, we'd like to start off with giving you a bit of an impression of the, um, the project uh, that frames this session of today. Our Family Business Histories project is a collaborative project between New York U University Abu Dhabi and the Tharawat Family Business Forum. And I'd like to invite Professor Martin Klimke from New York University uh, to come on uh, online and uh, introduce our project in a couple of slides. Thank you very much, Farida. We're very, very happy to, you know, launch our third case study today. Um, and, you know, we are celebrating our partnership and our collaboration. Um, and, you know, just a brief reminder in case you haven't, you know, seen previous uh, webinars or haven't heard of our project, you know, we're trying really to um, you know, do something new by compiling, documenting, and analyzing the history, legacy, and the socioeconomic impact of family businesses in the GCC in Manassa region. That's our mission, you know, as a project. Uh, the reason being is that uh, we have a lot of uh, family-owned businesses in the private sector, as you can see here on this map, you know, detailing the percentage of family-owned businesses in the private sector. So it's a huge chunk of the economy, uh, and we're very eager to explore this and giving, you know, family businesses their due in economic activities and analyses. Uh, some of the world's oldest family businesses you see here, um, you know, on display worldwide. Uh, one of the key trajectories of our project is obviously to highlight you know, the family businesses in the region that we're looking at. Um, so our goals really as part of this project is to understand the history you know, through academic research of these family businesses uh, that we're uh, looking at and also to highlight their legacy. You know, we're especially interested you know, in the various generational components, you know, two or three or more generations of each family businesses, how that dynamic unfolded uh, through time and also obviously um, preserving the heritage you know, of these family uh, businesses through archival uh, processes, digitization, uh, oral histories, and so on and so forth. And last but not least, obviously, uh, the goal here is to inspire the future to have an impact you know, on uh, the current business leaders in various fields by making them aware of the history uh, and the shoulders that they stand on as current day entrepreneurs. Why? I mean, that's obviously, uh, you know, uh, something that we have thought about a lot. Um, as I said, family businesses, you know, make a huge chunk of the economy all over the world, in particular in the Manassa economies, they're a pillar of those economies. Their sustainability is crucial to the region at large. Uh, family businesses require uh, vision and joint purpose, and we'll talk about the governance component in today's webinar, um, as well as the collective decision-making processes. And I think our historic understanding and the shared identity is key for that particular strategic vision uh, for the future. In other words, we're trying to use our case studies as opportunities to learn from the historical challenges um, that business founders and leaders have faced in the past, and usually using family businesses as a prism through which we can view the, country, uh, the, the countries um, as well as the region's multifaceted histories. Um, over to you, Farida. 
Thank you so much, Martin, for this introduction. And um, obviously today is a, is a special day for us and for our research team, uh, because after about two years of work, uh, we're able to launch um, the case study on NCA Ruiba, an Algerian family business. Uh, and you can go to our website. We will also paste the link uh, in the chat uh, brief uh, shortly, so you can download the case study. Uh, this time, the case study is written not just in English and in Arabic, but also in French, because of course, uh, a large portion of uh, the Mag Maghreb um, is still very much French speaking. And we wanted to make sure that this case study is available to as many pe people as possible. So this would not be a special occasion, of course, to launch this case study if we weren't able to um, bring on board uh, the driver behind allowing us to write this case study, who is uh, Mr. Slim Othmani, the former chairman of NCA Ruiba. And I'd like to invite Slim to join us um, with camera and sound, and I hope it's going to hold. So welcome, Slim, to this session. Hello. Uh, thank you, Farida. And thank you, Martin. Thank you, uh, Tharawat team, for giving us this opportunity. Our pleasure, our pleasure, Slim. And I'd like to say um, up front that we are truly grateful for um, the, the openness and the, the availability that you have shown for our research team to, to visit you in Algeria, to visit your factory, and to really try and document the history of NCA Ruiba in, in much detail. So thank you very much for, for that openness and, and uh, generosity of sharing. Um, what, we will be, what we will be doing um, is to kick off, uh, we will hand over to Slim, uh, for for a couple of minutes for because obviously um many of our, our, our uh, guests today have not yet seen the case study. So we wanted to hear the story about NCA Ruiba from, uh, from yourself, uh, Slim. So we'd love for you to kind of give us a quick overview over um, the quite moved actually history of NCA Ruiba. And then after that, we will come back and have a conversation all together. I'd like to encourage all our, um, I'd like to encourage all our attendees to really share their thoughts, you know, engage with us, uh, this is supposed to be a very interactive session. So without any further ado, Slim, over to you, and thanks again for being here with us. Thank you, Farida. You know, all my commitment to family businesses, uh, research, and uh, I, it's a subject that, of a great interest uh, for me. And um, talking about uh, the history of uh, NCA Riba, um, I'm, I'm not going to make it long. It's a history of agribusiness. Uh, uh, an agribusiness led by a family uh, in uh, North Africa, mainly in Algeria. But I said North Africa because it started before the independence uh, of Algeria. Uh, since the family moved during the colonial period, they moved to Tunisia, my grandfather, uh, with uh, not his kids, because uh, all the kids were born uh, in, in Tunisia. They moved in Tunisia at the border uh, of Algeria because they find it safer and easier, uh, easy, easier to do business there because my grandfather was a wholesaler of uh, 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 agri product, you know, canned food, fruits, vegetables, uh, etc. And uh, in 1966, um, the story began because um, he has one of his kids, it's my father. Uh, uh, I could say that the story began with the entrepreneurship spirit of, uh, of the elder one, which is uh, my father called Salah. And in 1966, he uh, convinced the family uh, after uh, the end of colonization, he convinced them uh, to move to Algeria, the country they haven't seen, uh, no one of the kids haven't seen. So they, uh, they arrived in 1966 in Algeria and uh, in the agribusiness, he decided to create a plant uh, uh, to produce uh, canned food. And from 1996 to 1972, the, the, the company was managed by my grandfather and my father. During the period since until 2019, there is six big period. The first one is 1966, 1972, my father and my grandfather are managing the business in a, let's say in a modern environment because it was the, the, uh, uh, the remaining of an economy a liberal economy uh, set by the French uh, in Algeria. In 1972, things started changing because Algeria had decided to 
follow uh, social communism. I'm not going to call it socialist. I'm not going to call it communist, but social communism. And it changed radically uh, the, the business environment for private entrepreneurs and, and, and also for the family because we're in the industry. And the government decided to nationalize many, many, many uh, companies, all the private companies uh, that shows, um, let's say, a huge potential uh, for, for the government. And uh, we were uh, on the list and hopefully uh, uh, at the uh, last minute, one day before uh, they decide to nationalize us uh, uh, in 1973, uh, they decided not to do it for many reasons because the family and my father had a lot uh, the, the Algerian revolution and we were too small to show really an interest for the uh, Algerian government. So from 1970, 270 uh, to 1990, sorry for my English. Uh, the business was managed by my father, my grandfather, and my uncles. Unfortunately, 1978, my grandfather passed away, and uh, my father has decided for political reason. Uh, I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, he, he decided to uh, to go to France and to stay there for a long period of time, a few years. And the management was in hand with my with my uncles uh, Saeed and uh, and uh, and my uncle uh, Hedi. So till 1990, the business is facing more and more challenges. Uh, to overcome because the business environment was totally unstable. We, uh, there is no way to, uh, 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 to forecast anything, sales, procurements, whatsoever. You don't know the laws are changing gradually and Algeria started facing huge issue about uh, the availability of foreign currency because, the, uh, because of the drop. Uh, uh, in oil prices at the end of the 80s. And Algeria uh, have a huge debt, uh, uh, close to $30 billion, which uh, and the country was enabled to uh, repay at that moment the debt. And 1990, uh, 1991, the crisis of, uh, of the debt really uh, uh, led to big troubles in Algeria. Uh, um, it's 1988 the troubles that start, but uh, uh, the 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 uh, the apex or uh, the uh, of uh, of the troubles happened at the end of 1990 1991 uh, with the. Uh, uh, a political uh, problem, the, uh, the army stopped uh, the uh, legislative uh, uh, election process and, uh, and the civil war started until, uh, uh, to, until uh, 2000, until the arrival of Bouteflika in 1999. And from 1990 to 1999, uh, I was not in the, in the, in the picture before 1990. Uh, I was living in Canada and I decided to return to Algeria where my father also decided to be more involved uh, in the business. And uh, he returned also from France. Uh, more or less we returned at the same period uh, uh, and the period of civil war. Uh, everyone is asking me, but you are completely crazy going to Algeria in 1991. The, the, the country will, will explode. We, we, we faced uh, during the whole period 200,000 deaths. So it, it was another challenge, a challenge of the business environment and a security challenge. And, uh, and I... I can say many things about this this period, many things about leadership, many things about uh, security issue, how to handle that, many things on how to motivate uh, people in an secure environment, and many things about the relation with the authority uh, related to the business environment, which is a very important topics from my point of view. 1999 uh, uh, to 2019, uh, Bouteflika arrived and uh, civil war ended and uh, the price of oil uh, started uh, going up and uh, it was let's say a, a, a really wealthy period and the private sector uh, exploded in, in, in Algeria 
unfortunately for not for a long period of time uh, because uh, in 2005 as usual instability in, in algeria not political instability but uh, uh, business environment instability has led to the stop in uh, the opening of the country to foreign direct investment and to denationalization process they stopped everything uh, we, up to now we don't know why but we have an idea about why but it's not the purpose of uh, uh, of our meeting and uh, in 1999 the story about the company is that uh, 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 during family uh, meeting uh, i propose to take the control of NCA Ruiba. I had a plan to make Ruiba another company, uh, to manage in a different style the company. Uh, during, from 1966 until 1999, it was a really family business old style management. Uh, orders are coming daily from the family members no one knows who's the head uh, of the company, but they know that my father is the head of the company, but he delegate everything to his brothers and, uh, and the employee. And even, you know, the relation with the employee is totally uh, unclear and non-transparent. 1999, so uh, I present my plan to the family. They agree on that. I can talk if someone uh, uh, want to hear about that, I'm, I'm, I would be glad to explain exactly how I do it. Uh, I explained to the family member that we need to, to change. We need to uh, professionalize uh, the management of the company. And uh, we need to address many issues that I identified and I showed them. And uh, they accepted that I control totally the company. By the way, I was already at that time the biggest shareholder because of the decision of my father. And he, he gave me all his shares and he split it with me and my sister. And um, so I became de facto the general manager of the company and my father was the president, but the president, uh, honorary president without any uh, decision uh, uh, the, without any decision, uh, let's say, um, uh, not right, but uh, he, he's not taking decision. He, he gave me all the, the decision in hand. Uh, until uh, 2017, my father passed away. We uh, have, uh, let's say, improved the management uh, of the company. We introduced an investment fund in the company. Uh, we work uh, a lot on the governance of the company. We apply strict govern governance rule, which is uh, something uh, that, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, creates sort of uh, stress and challenges uh, in the relation with the family because, you know, during 1966 to 1999, the uh, the style of the management is exactly the same uh, uh, all the, the the business families in uh, in the country we overcome challenges with the business environment with the rule with the fiscal system so everyone is playing with the fiscal system is playing with the business environment to uh, to make sure that uh, his investment is procuring uh, the right return to the family members that are shareholders. So uh, when, when you start applying strict gover governance rule, you discover that you are not making as much money as you expect from out of your business because the fiscal system is uh, in the country is totally incoherent and uh, uh, we call it a uh, 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 confiscatory uh, fiscal system. It means that you are working for the government, you are not working for the shareholders, which is a different uh, approach. Uh, so we try to, let's say, to balance in between and create a situation where shareholders could be happy and without, uh, uh, without, in, um, uh, without, uh, um, uh, I don't know, uh, without um, uh, breaking the, 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 uh, the rules of law. So 2019, uh, I, at the end of 2019, because also we faced a lot of issues related to, uh, to the economical crisis that hit Algeria in 2014, 2015, 
and uh, because of the arrival of COVID, uh, we faced a lot of issue internally also, and uh, I decided to uh, uh, to bring another shareholder who took the majority of the company at the end of 2019, and I decided to resign as president of the company, and I decided to resign uh, from from the day-to-day -day operation and. Now, that's why I'm the past president of NCA Riva. Now, I'm just board member and I'm paying, taking care of the company, taking care of the business environment of the company, because now I'm, uh, I'm heading since uh, 15 years, uh, a think tank that take care about the business uh, environment uh, in Algeria and promote uh, uh, economic reforms. Uh, this is one part of, um, let's say, my... Uh, my idea of being a, a, a businessman uh, <coughs> uh, in, um, in in Algeria or everywhere in the in the world, um, as I as I used to say, um, an entrepreneur has the responsibility not only within the wall of his company. His responsibilities goes goes beyond the wall, so he has to pay attention to what was outside. So this is for the historical part of uh, 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 of Ruiba in in brief, and uh, and um, you see that you understand that we overcome different challenges uh, regarding the business environment that has a huge influence on the way we are managing our business, mm -hmm. and also the issue within the family of the ex next generation uh, and uh, uh, that uh, I'm, I'm part of it mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, the uh, the founders that are passing away then it creates different uh, stress uh, in the relation with the family mm -hmm. members. Mm -hmm. We can talk later about the uh, COVID issues and uh, how to manage under pressures and politics, etc. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Slim, for this uh, very concise uh, overview over a very yeah. um, complex history. Uh, I think that's uh, that's yeah. definitely a, a very very impressive uh, timeline that you've you've given us. Um, I'll get started with a couple of questions um, from from my side and, of course, from Martin's side. But I'd like to invite, of course, anyone who, even if you have a comment or if you have a question, please feel free to share with us. Um, we'd like to make this an interactive conversation. Um, Slim, just maybe to to um, to add to your story um, towards the end, we have to say that, of course, you have your son who is a director in in the company at at the moment. Um, maybe let's let's get started a little bit on the conversation of. Um, continuous entrepreneurship. So you have, um, as a family business, as you've explained to us, you've gone through extreme phases of pressure, uh, mostly macroeconomic, but also internal. Um, can you explain to us a little bit what it is that you think has made sure that, in a way, in each generation, um, there was an entrepreneurial spirit that kept going? Do you feel that that is uh, it's a coincidence or is there something in the value system or in the education of your family that has contributed to that entrepreneurship um, to continue across generations? You know, I asked myself many times when I gave speeches, unfortunately in French, uh, to students uh, in Algeria about entrepreneurship. Uh, uh, do we uh, are we born entrepreneur? Is there a genetics in that? Yes, no. Uh, I think not everyone could be entrepreneur. Uh, I think it has to do with education more. I'm not going to talk about genetics, otherwise I will go to other other stuff more more complicated. Um, it has to do with education, and it has to do with uh, the environment you grew uh, in. When I was a kid, I remember when I'm visiting Algeria, I, I grew up in Tunisia, but I, I, I go once or twice a year uh, in Algeria. My father take me to the plant. Uh, in Tunisia, we have kept our businesses as wholesalers. So, uh, and uh, I, I want to visit uh, the family that are managing uh, this uh, wholesaler business. And I have the smell of the of the product, uh, uh, the spices, uh, the, um, the 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 spicy the spicy uh, ingredient that they are selling, the kind of food, the food, the vegetable, uh, etc. So uh, 
I was I, I grew I grew up in that, and I understand. I started understanding the dynamics of the business in terms of logistics, in terms of human resources, in terms of competency, in terms in terms of equipment production uh, that we need, etc. And you know, you don't know when you're a kid. You don't know how many information you 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 uh, you collect. But those information at the end. Uh, you know, uh, integrated themselves together and make your uh, entrepreneurship uh, spirit or your center of interest uh, in your in your in your brain. Uh, why I didn't show any interest in aeronautics? Why I didn't show any interest in other stuff? It has to do only with education. I, I probably, mm -hmm. if I grew in a family of painter, I would mm -hmm. have been probably I, I would have been a painter, uh, mm -hmm. an artist, uh, not painter, uh, building, but an artist. Oh, why not? Uh, or why not? Painter, yeah. Not? <laughs> exactly. So, so, uh, so it's not. Uh, uh, I don't think it's a coincidence. It's only um, the fact that you grew up in that environment, so you have the sensitivity for that environment. And, but one thing, uh, I think it's very important. Um, I don't have, for me, uh, I don't know, my, my father want me either be a doctor or be, uh, uh, or, uh, uh, or, um, or be involved in his businesses. I choose the, the one that I have the sensitivity with. But uh, I will not, I have, I have decided not to push my kids to go mm -hmm. Uh, in that direction, I mm -hmm. I told them choose whatever you want. the The world is full of opportunities. Don't don't uh, re refrain yourself from exploring other uh, world of opportunity than the one of agribusiness. So, um, my daughter went to the art in Berlin. By the way. Uh, uh, my daughter went 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 to the art uh, environment. My mm -hmm. uh, my son Yusuf, he stayed in the company uh, until now. He's a marketing manager, but uh, but he decided to explore other entrepreneurship uh, uh, opportunities while being a marketing manager. That has nothing to do with the agribusiness. I'm happy about. I'm really happy about that. So, to make it short. It's how you were educated, how you grew up, and how you see also you see also the challenges uh, the the family overcome. And if you are a man of challenges, which I, I am, I'm I don't I'm a golf player, and uh, all golf players that are uh, listening to us, there's a difference between having the ball on the fairway and having the ball on the in the rough. I'm a very strong in the rough, in the fairway. I'm a good player, but I'm not as good as in the rough. In the rough, I can find a solution. In the fairway, the solution is here. Uh, let's say it's it's wrong what I'm saying, but because sometimes in, in fairway, the solution is very difficult to find. But I prefer to be in the rough than being in the fairway, which is very strange. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Slim. Well, speaking of challenges, I think this is um, certainly a wonderful transition. Um, your company and its products have you know become uh, over the decades uh, or have risen to national prominence and at the same time i think the history of your company is you know um, taking place at the same time that the country itself is go undergoing you know um, turbulent political and economic waters so how would you reflect on you know the impact you know the political context has had on your business operations over the years you, you touched on it already in the introduction uh, but but how, how would you reflect on that in general yeah um let me consider only only one period the last period because it they they change too much and mm. it has a huge impact uh, all i can say i can distinguish distinguish, distinguish two periods before 1990 uh, 1990 and after 1990 mm -hmm. before 1990 could you imagine an industry in an industrial company in the agribusiness that is not allowed to invest in equipment to produce which is completely crazy but the country is working like that if you want to improve uh, the uh, your your operation 
uh, have uh, an, a new equipment that gives you uh, 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 an advantage or a competitive advantage or improve your productivity, uh, uh, reduce your waste, etc. You're not allowed to buy it. So what we are doing at that period, uh, I heard it because I'm not managing the company, I heard it from my father and my uncle and I saw it. Uh, we import some equipment that we really need, it, need them in spare parts. They dismantle, the, the seller is dismantled totally his line of production and they send it to us in pieces and we reassemble the production line not a huge production line, but at least small production lines, uh, we reassemble them uh, to have some. So there is a huge impact on uh, how uh, we, we operate. Secondly, sometimes we need uh, some packaging uh, uh, to, to produce uh, uh, at, the, at the international standards. Could you imagine a company that needs that type of packaging that is not available in the country, and the government allow you to import a less, you will listen to me, less than 0.3% of your production capacity yearly. So you have lines that produce 0.3% maximum of your capacity, which is completely crazy. Yeah. How are we how are we handling that? We are handling that by producing other stuff with local with local uh, packaging. Uh, those local packaging are, are not com uh, are not complying with international standard regarding the health regarding etc. But we couldn't do uh, anything. We, we have to deal with that. Now the second period. <laughs> After 1990, we are allowed to do whatever we want. We can import packaging, we can import uh, uh, equipment until 1999, and until 2000, sorry. Uh, I'm not saying that after 2000, they, uh, uh, the, 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 it is forbidden, but the rules are changing dramatically. During the civil war, it was a period uh, where we witnessed a really, really uh, commitment from the government and the Algerian administration to promote private entrepreneur in Algeria. You got authorization within 24 hours. Everything is easy. Laws are clear. We are working in an incredible, smoothly, in an incredible way. It's perfect. When civil war stopped, the, the bureaucracy to cover the control of all the economy of the country. And they said, okay, we were very nice with you during 10 years. Now we, we have to beat you a little bit because it works like that and the power is in our hands. We don't want the power goes in hand with the private sector. So they decided to create uh, hundreds of uh, rules that makes uh, our life terrible uh, in terms of how to buy. You, you, you are allowed to buy uh, only by letter of credit. You are not to allowed to buy things from, uh, from import things without a letter of credit. It's an example. Um, they are creating obstacles and uh, they make the life of entrepreneurs really terrible. We, are, we consider that we are spending 85% of our time solving bureaucratic issue with the Algerian administration instead of uh, paying attention to our businesses in marketing, in production quality, uh, consumer, uh, uh, consumer behavior, consumer uh, requests, etc. So we deal a lot of, with political issues. That's why in 1997, uh, in, 1990, in, 90, uh, in 2000, at the end of 1999, I decided to create a think tank to address mm -hmm. those really uh, business environmental uh, environment uh, issue, uh, and uh, and we decided to we, we the, the the think tank was called Care. If people are showing interest in doing business in Algeria, where we produce a lot a lot of things, we even mm -hmm. have produced uh, the dashboard of the Algerian economy, which is a fantastic product. It's called care.dz, care.dz, it's very easy, C-R-R-E. So, and we, uh, through this uh, think tank, 
I had a great impact on the decision process. Secondly, it, which, which is very important for me, um, I, there is no entrepreneur association that is very active. So instead of going for an entrepreneur association that is uh, uh, fear from the government, I decided to, to create the Drink Producer Association. This association uh, gather all the drink producer. Uh, at the beginning, they were afraid about that. Well, what is this association? We're going to be together. Uh, we are competitor. We couldn't be in the same association. But after one year, they realized the impact that we could have on the decision of the government. And we, we, uh, we um, as example, there is a decision taken in the fiscal law, mm -hmm. and we broke that decision. After one month, it was published because we were strong, we were together, we represent a force in the country. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have many hats as entrepreneur, as president of the think tank, at that moment as president of the, uh, of the Drink Producer Association, and uh, it gives to Ruiba brand also uh, a, another identity, uh, a, a strong uh, identity of a company that is uh, uh, socially responsible uh, in the country. Uh, and we apply strict govern, governance rule uh, that help us do that. Because if someone tried to, let's say, to squeeze me, he couldn't tell me that you are playing with the figures of your company or you are uh, over invoicing things to make to have mm -hmm. money abroad in Switzerland or whatsoever. They couldn't do it because I, I, I don't do uh, stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, to protect myself and to protect the image of the company of and the company. to make sure that all my, all, uh, uh, the plaidoyer, uh, all my, uh, the plaidoyers, uh, 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 all the action that I'm leading to improve the business environment and, and promote reforms in the country, mm -hmm. is heard properly by, uh, by the, the, the government. I mean, it's a fascinating, uh, thank you so much, Slim, for, for, clarifying this because basically what you're saying is that if you're an entrepreneur in a highly volatile environment um, your job is is far more than just managing your your day-to-day -day operations it, it literally yeah. is to secure the overall environment for the company yeah. to even exist and I think that's a fascinating you know facet to yeah. to to explore um, and as, specifically if we take into consideration the current context especially in the MENA some of the MENA countries are you know very much facing similar um, kind of volatility and and have to make you know uh, make do with those realities as well i'm going to take um two of the questions from the audience slim if you don't mind um so there's there's two that i'm going to link up because uh, they kind of relate to the family dynamics. And of course, I, I, I want to make sure that, you know, you're comfortable uh, answering. I, I know you only answer the things you're comfortable answering. Uh, but the first part of the question is, um, did you consult your father when, when you, because you made drastic changes to the company. So before suggesting that and before implementing, did you have a conversation with your father or did he just let you decide freely? And then the second question um, that I'd like to pick up is the family conflict that led you perhaps not for the business to be sold necessarily but to bring in uh, the investors uh, on board mm. uh, so uh, regarding the decision process it depends uh, of your personal personality in my case uh, unfortunately I'm a strong believer in democracy but not in my business sometimes uh, because I know that there's moment where someone has to take decision because it's tough time you don't have uh, um, it's very difficult to appreciate that uh, you have to take decision for sure you think about what kind of process you have intuition that that tells you that you have to go in that direction you have figures that co that uh, 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 that uh, uh, give you the comfort about uh, taking yeah. that decision but you don't want to be in in uh, in tough moment, you don't want to to have this interference of people that are asking you, oh no, don't do it. I think of doing. It. We face, I face that. I face mm -hmm. that. I told them, okay, you want to continue with the canned food business? Canned food business is dead in our uh, in our plan. 
for many reasons, and I explained to them. They said, but Canut food is, um, is something that we have done historically since 1966. We have, we have to continue to do that. Uh, equipment totally out of date, dying. Uh, 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 employee too old to be uh, uh, trained again and be op uh, 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 and operate properly on the, on the equipment. We need to invest heavily to change completely, and we don't have the space to, to install new equipment or modern equipment in that. So all the reasons, and there's many other reasons, and all the reasons are here not to continue. But they insist, okay, I told them, okay, this is, uh, those are the equipment. If one of you want to do it, the equipment are here. And the plant, uh, uh, the, we sacrifice 30% of our space occupation in the plant to let those equipment aside like this here. Everyone is coming, they look at the equipment, equipment not working because they are too old <laughs> and uh, no one want me uh, to remove those equipment of the plants. And at the fourth year, I came and I said, okay, no one of you have done anything with this equipment. I get rid of it and I build the new the new plant, but it's a waste of time. It's mm -hmm. a huge waste, mm -hmm. waste mm -hmm. of time. So mm -hmm. to come to your question about personality, sometimes you have to take decision uh, alone without uh, consulting. And my in my family, I have taken many times decision alone because I uh, uh, in my education and the the, the life I had. Uh, uh, far away from my father, alone with my mother. Uh, I have always uh, uh, taken decision alone. Mm -hmm. So it's my management style. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I like to think a lot about decision to take, but alone. Mm -hmm. It's very bad. I know. I will not recommend that to anyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, But gradually, you started identifying the people who could help that you can work process. with. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'm not saying people that tell you, yes, it's good. People that helps you mm -hmm. go to the decision, good or not good, but not people that come, oh, no, it's bad. I, I don't like that. I like mm -hmm. someone that when I share with him my thoughts, my idea, we started looking at the different directions and then I come to the conclusion. He don't, I don't want to come to the, come to the conclusion. That, like many consultants do, they go to the conclusion and they kill you. And uh, the second question is about... Uh, the the uh, conflict that led you to bring in the, uh, the, the investors. Uh, yeah, the uh, there's two moments. There is a moment of conflicts that uh, uh, brought investors because uh, the the company the first uh, uh, the first conflict happened in 2004 2003 we need a, we, the company is growing like hell so in every growing company we need cash and uh, the we we don't want to borrow money from the ba bank because we already have borrowed enough in accordance with the figures of the company and um, I, I looked at the shareholders I told them we need cash. Uh, every one of you has to put cash. They said, no, we don't put cash. I told them, so if you don't put cash, the, the company will collapse because it's growing like hell and we couldn't uh, manage that. It's impossible. The, the bank are, uh, are full. So they say, no, we don't want. I saw that, I told them, okay. And, and all of a sudden, the idea of having an external board member in the board of the company uh, makes sense because yeah. The family, yeah. the behavior of the family member in a board member where there is not family members is changing radically. Sure. So I told them there is an investment, there is an investment fund uh, who is paying attention. He, he's paying uh, a big interest to, to Ruiba. They want to to be in for twenty five or thirty percent of uh, uh, of the company. Uh, they said no. I said yes. They said no, I said yes. And then I decided because I have enough uh, right to decide. Uh, and uh, they, they accepted to sign. They signed and we have this investment fund that broke uh, that brought a lot, a lot to, to the management of the company, uh, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, and uh, but uh, as uh, uh, any investment funds, uh, they have to uh, quit after a certain period of time. Mm-hmm. And uh, we went to the stock exchange. Uh, we made sure that uh, uh, the investment fund could quit through the stock exchange. Unfortunately, the investment fund want to quit f- for only uh, two thirds of his uh, shares, and they kept one third of the, their shares uh, until 2019. And in 2019, we, we don't have a conflict. We have a big issue with one of the family member who uh, played, played with the figures in a, in a way that even the board couldn't uh, see that. It's a kind of Ponzi uh, pyramid with the, with the figures of the, of the company. And when we discovered that uh, uh, during 2018, uh we started discussing with him because the amount is uh, very important and could lead to the bankruptcy of the company mm-hmm. and uh, he he was at that time the general manager of the company i was only the president of the board and uh we tried to adjust to correct with him and to help him get out of this uh, of this issue because he's a family member mm-hmm. and uh, he couldn't he couldn't uh, find a solution and uh, the only way for us uh, in uh, in summer 2019 is uh, to close the company the 31st of December mm-hmm. or to find uh, to find an investor who is interested in uh, in being uh, in the board for uh, for an important amount to bring in the company and hopefully we found uh, an investor who is a French company mm-hmm. uh, uh, they don't allow me to sit uh, even uh, everyone knows their name they are not allowed to to give their name or to talk sure. on their behalf uh, sure. so i'm not talking on their behalf and mm-hmm. uh, i uh, i have them now uh, in the company and i accepted to uh, to be diluted i haven't mm-hmm. sold my uh, shares but at least i saved the the, the jobs i saved the That's brands right. i saved the history of the company and, mm-hmm. and now the company returned to uh, what I was expected, growth, well management, transparency, good governance, and, okay. and so on. So, uh, but it's a big challenge fi- finding uh, more than 30 million uh, euro in, uh, in two months uh, to be injected in the company, <laughs> yeah. especially, especially in, in the business environment uh, that we have uh, in Algeria. Of course. Totally unstable. The, we, we have changed in laws every two to three months could you imagine you it's impossible to uh, to forecast anything impossible. yeah yeah um martin do you have any any follow-up questions on this thank you so I'm... much team for uh, for for explaining this no i think uh, that, that was fascinating i think one of the things that come from the audience a question that i wanted to invite you to reflect on is um have the consumers, you know, been aware that you operate as a family business, and was that an advantage that was already, you know, visible in the time of your father leading the company? You know, it's very strange because we discovered when I start, uh, when I started my plan of restructuring Riba, I told the family, we don't know anything about the consumer in uh, in this company. Do you know who is the consumer? Who is buying our product? Why they are buying them? and how to improve uh, our value proposition. And uh, they didn't answer. And then I discovered that the consumer didn't know that we are a family business. They thought that we were nationalized in the 70s. Could you imagine? Uh-huh. We were in 2000 and still people think that we are a, a public company, which is incredible. All the effort we have done to communicate and my let's say my personality in the in the in the business environment in algeria everyone knows that i'm the president of riba but they, they thought that i'm uh, i'm a president appointed by the government for a public company so it's a, which is amazing uh, but the consumer uh, are not uh, unfortunately in uh, socialist communist systems uh, they educate people with the idea that private sector is hell. Mm -hmm. So whatever direction you take, either you go at the end of your studies, you you go and you work as a civil servant, or you create your own company, civil servant is like going to heaven. And creating your own company is like uh, signing a pact uh, with Faust, uh, uh, with hell. So... (laughs) 
It's, it's very strange. And even the media, when they talk about private sector, they didn't talk positively. They always talk about thieves, private sector, they are thieves, uh, etc. They always say that. And this is also one of the action that uh, I'm trying uh, to overcome, uh, issue them, uh, that I'm trying to overcome since more than 20 years, is that changing the appreciation of the private sector in the country, which is impossible because the government is playing with that. They want to make sure that private sector didn't get any piece of power in the country. And in all dictatorships, I'm not saying 100% dictator, uh, dictature uh, we have in Algeria, but it's a kind of dictatorship since 1962. In every kind of system that works like that, that, that works exactly the same in North Africa, private sector either has to be, we call it, I think, crony private sector, it means a strong link with the government and the government control them, or a silent private sector that haven't say any words uh, to change things. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult to make the consumer appreciate what we are doing. Uh, and uh, it, it's, it's, a long, it's a long road. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to make to make the the, the, the environment change the appreciation about uh, uh, about the private sector I, I always find thank you Steve for explaining that because uh, to be honest I always find that very fascinating because Algeria has a very very specific makeup because of its political history of course uh, and and whenever we speak to family firms in Algeria they they kind of reflect that complexity of the relationship not just with with government but also with the with with society right how do we how do we make sure that we understand uh, um, you know, um, how, how, how to interact with our ecosystem and be successful at the same time. And I'd like to start slowly. Unfortunately, we have to start closing already. I know we can keep going for hours, uh, but, but I think um, perhaps um, one of the questions I'd like to pick up from the audience uh, before going to our last question is, um, how is it possible, Slim, to create successful companies in such an environment? Uh, and perhaps we don't even have to look at Algeria specifically only, but you know, how do we create successful companies in highly volatile environments? What can we learn from, from Ruiba? You know, uh, I can talk hours about, about that because I think it's the most interesting part uh, uh, of uh, your entrepreneurship, uh, uh, how do you call it, uh, 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 day, uh, mm -hmm. or, or your entrepreneur's day. And, uh, Journey, maybe. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, those uh, thousands of challenges uh, gives you the sense that there is no limit, no limit to be an entrepreneur, whatever environment you're in. You can overcome whatever issue everything is possible uh, for an entrepreneur who really wants to succeed. So uh, everyone asks me, but if you complain about the business environment, why you haven't left and went to easier environment? You, you, you lived in Canada, why you didn't stay in Canada? I came here for family uh, reason, and then I discovered an, an environment that fit with my personal skills. I like challenges, I like to fight. Uh, I like to, uh, I like a uh, very difficult issue to overcome. I remember when I was at the university studying uh, computer engineer, uh, I was specialized in inter inter uh, artificial intelligence, but 40 years ago, could you imagine what was in artificial <laughs> intelligence 30 years ago? It's completely stupid. My, um, my French teacher, uh, I don't know if you call it teacher, I use that word in, at the university. Uh, he told me, Slim, I think that you have an incredible capacity in finding solution in very difficult pro problems. I told him, I don't know why. I know, I know that I really have that uh, ability. And uh, he told me, use it as much as you can. It's exactly that what I'm doing. Difficult, uh, difficult problems, solution. There is solution to everything. And uh, it simulates uh, uh, my entrepreneurship spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Honestly, Slim, it's, it's, I've, we've had the pleasure, of course, over the past years of speaking to you very often. And it's to, to me personally, as a member of a family business and, and you know, to my sisters, it's always an inspiration to speak to you, um, to be very honest. And, and you always give us that energy of, you know, if you can do it there, you know, you can pretty much do it anywhere. It's a bit like New York, but in, you know, in a different way. Um, yeah. But uh, um, Martin, I'd like to hand over to you perhaps for some closing words from your side uh, before we come to to uh, end the session soon. Right, can no, I have thank a question you. Sure, yes. about COVID? Can, I, can, I, can we say a small word about COVID? Please. Of course, How of course. We are addressing COVID issue. Yeah, okay. I think for, for family uh, businesses and also for other families, I think we already talked about that, uh, COVID crisis is a huge, huge challenge, but mm -hmm. also Bring, it brings to the brain of entrepreneurs the ethic point. And the ethical point comes when, oh, there is an opportunity to, let's say, reduce the number of employees in my company, to reduce my cost, to reduce, to reduce salary, to reduce other things. And the ethical issue is an important, uh, the ethical point or value is an important value in the life of an entrepreneur that wants to succeed. So we have, you have all your set of value, but the ethical one is the most important one. You couldn't take decision that challenge or put people in a very difficult time uh, because you are not paying attention uh, to them. You are not uh, taking care of them in a, in a proper way. So in family business, more than in multinational businesses, uh, people are important. People that are working for you, people that you are interacting with. And, you, and if you hurt them, do not expect them to be nice with you and do mm -hmm. not expect them to work properly for, with you. So be ethical, be fair, but don't take sometimes opportunities uh, to make more money at the at the expense of others. The, this is my point. Thank you, Slim. Thank you very much. Thank you. There's nothing more I could add on that one. I mean, what I'll say is that, yes, I think this particular value question, the internal compass, your own drummer, you know, that's been very, very interesting to navigate the various challenges, I think, that we've been hearing about, you know, through your company's uh, history and into your family's journey, you know, through, you know, these particular turbulent waters. So we're really, really appreciative, you know, of, you know, all your time that you've spent with us. And there's much more in the case study. Um, so please go take a look at the case study and you see, you know, in more detail, you know, what we've been hearing uh, today. And, you know, again, thanks so much for joining us today. Over to you, Farida. Thank you very much. So same for me, Slim. Uh, as I said before, even before you made that very important second point, um, you know, it's, it's always an inspiration. Um, I feel that um, one of the contributions that we hope that this project is making is that through the lens of history, we, you know, we can literally inspire today's leaders as well, because, you know, right now, everybody is facing a difficult moment. Uh, and, and I think it's very important that we understand the complexity and the multitude of facets that impact business leaders. And I think you've really given us a wonderful um, kind of tour d'horizon of, of what is what it means to be a true, truly responsible um, and, and visionary uh, business leader. Before closing the session, um, I'd like to just give you a very quick outlook on what's what's going to come with regards to the project. So we have two more profiles that will be published, but at the same time, uh, we are working on revamping our website so that more and more information will be available on family business histories overall. And hopefully very soon we can announce a, an addition to our project uh, with regards to um, kind of an expansion of the research project uh, by itself. Um, please feel free to contact us. Um, we have had a fantastic audience that stayed with us for the full hour, which I'm very, very impressed with. If you have questions, if you have comments, please feel free to reach out. And um, I'd, I'd like to come back one more time to you, Slim. Um, uh, one of the things that I think you've, you've mentioned beautifully is the importance as an entrepreneur to be part of an ecosystem. Um, and I'd like to, to really 
give you that credit very much and very clearly that projects like these projects like ours couldn't exist without entrepreneurs who are ready and available you know to open their doors and to and to share so thank you once again slim for being with us thank you. Uh, and thank uh, you. we hope you enjoyed it uh, martin always thank you for the collaboration and, and for for joining us and thank you to all our um, attendees for being with us and hopefully see everyone very soon thank you uh, take care thank you Thank you. Bye.